Hello friends, today's episode is another presented in two parts. The first, the original recording made a few months ago, and the second, a follow-up after all the recent world events. Enjoy. How was that so far? That, that Did I start out with a bang? Really that was good. good. Really fascinating, right? <laughs> Welcome to the Memories of a Moonbird podcast, exploring life one story at a time. Hello friends, today on the show, you've seen him on TV and everything from sitcoms to soaps, but for almost 30 years now, you've actually heard him even more. From the gangster Vito Scaletta in the famous Mafia video game series to a plethora of roles in Marvel, Transformers, Halo, and other successful franchises, he's lent his voiceover talents to hundreds of titles and commercials that you know and love. He's also been on Broadway and stars in a touring one-man show he co-created called Channeling the King. Please welcome a man who's no stranger to a microphone, the very funny and incredibly talented Rick Pascalone. Rick, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. What was it like growing up in New York City? Uh, well, uh, I, I grew up on Long Island, so when you grow up on Long Island, it's kind of like you're, you're city adjacent your whole life. You're going to move that around? And yes, just, just I just creak and it. You're an engineer, right? right? <laughs> yeah, I'll just take it out. <laughs> Fix it in post. <laughs> Fix it in post. That's a classic. Uh, I, w- I couldn't wait to get off Long Island. I had a lot of friends that never wanted to leave, but as soon as I could, my, you know, my, uh, my dad was a musician. He worked in the city all the time, so mm. I got to kind of go in and experience what that was like. And then you know, later when I ventured out on my own, it was just, uh, I loved it. I still love it. Now, why were you so anxious to leave? Uh, I don't know that I was anxious to leave. It was just, it seemed at the time that I had done what I could do in New York. Uh, I had started out doing some theater and at the time there wasn't a lot of film and TV production. You know, there was basically law and order and that was it. And, uh, well, how old were you when you left? I was 25, something like that. And, um, yeah, I just decided it was time for a change. And, um, can't get farther away than Los Angeles without leaving the country. So there you go. Did you travel when you were a kid growing up with your family? We did. We traveled. Uh, we, uh, my, my family's Italian. My father uh, was born there. He, uh, we still have family there. So that was probably my first big trip as a kid. What going, part of Italy is your family? They're from Abruzzi. Uh, where's that? Wait, let me put the music into it. They're from Abruzzi. We're Abruzzese, <laughs> um, which is central Italy, not very touristy gen- destination, more really just about, you know, families. And that's uh, that's where the family's from, and that's where they still are. That's cool. Uh, what percentage do you think today? Have you been out in California how long now? Mm, I want to say about 20, yeah, almost, almost 30 years, I guess. So what percentage are you still New York Italian Rick, and what percentage are you Rick LA guy? I'll tell you how it works. I've tried very hard over the years to lose my New York accent and, you know, be just kind of... Just a guy, you know, that could be anything. My New York comes out in direct proportion to how annoyed I am at any particular moment. <laughs> so if I'm out at the store and the guy that up the spot I'm waiting for, a guy takes my spot, all of a sudden I start to go, did you not see me standing over here waiting for that spot? Are you, lo- what are you, th-? if you start to hear me say things like Gita and what the, then you know that you're in a lot of trouble. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> So I have, a, I have a surprise question for you, Ooh. directly from Noah. I'm supposed to ask you, why did they call you weed when you were growing up? This is a mystery that really shouldn't ever be on earth. I have no idea. We all had these bizarre names uh, growing up. I think it was because I was very, very, very skinny, like a little weed, and that was amusing to them. We were way too young to be smoking pot. and I didn't <laughs> Yeah, he said it wasn't. A, no, wasn't I didn't smoke pot until I was in college. Uh, so it was... Uh, I have no idea. He said it was because you were tall and skinny. And also he said you were the fastest running kid that anyone had ever seen. No one could outrun you. By the way, for the listeners, Noah is a mutual friend of ours in New York. That is a true story, but you have to take it into context. I was growing up in suburban Long Island. It was not known for uh, Olympic quality athletes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's be real. <laughs> so at what age do you think you decided you wanted to be an entertainer? Was it always in your blood? Were you performing as a kid? Like- I guess it's always a part of you. Uh, it's just how, you know how much you want to devote to it. Uh, my father was a musician. I always, I always loved playing music. I was, I was, you know, kind of pursuing music for, for a little while before. What's your main instrument? Uh, guitar. But I played trumpet. My dad was a trumpet player. He taught me the trumpet. Um, I was always, I always loved music. Um, my mom was a huge Elvis fan, Beatles fan, you know, so that was the music that I grew up with. And we had instruments all over the house. So mm. uh, I just gravitated to that. 
but um, it wasn't yeah, do you still until play guitar today? I still do. Yeah, I still play. I still enjoy it. But I decided not to pursue that as a career. But it wasn't until I graduated college, came back to New York that I thought, hmm, let me maybe try to give this a go. What's your college degree in? Psychology. <laughs> How are you feeling today, Daniel? I feel pretty excellent. <laughs> Thank you for asking. See, see what I did there? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so using that every day. Oh, well, you know, you're raising a couple of kids, I and I think you would use that psychology degree often. It's useless because <laughs> because because nobody gives you a book on how to read. Well, there are books, but you might forget it because every day is just it's 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 just like unwrapping a fortune cookie. You don't, you don't just don't know what you're going to get. They ask you the most bizarre, <laughs> off the wall questions, and you have to answer them like you know exactly what you're talking about. Is that all the the, time. Uh, the secret of seeming like a genius is pretending that you've known forever what you just learned 15 minutes ago? 100. percent So what's something bizarre that your kids have asked you? That's something funny. Well, you know they <laughs> maybe not bizarre. Well, I'll give you an example. So last night I'm I'm, I'm prepping, um, helping my son prepare for a math quiz. Now he's um, he's in middle school. I have a college degree, as we've <laughs> as we've already established. I already love where this is going. I am helping him with his homework, and I am secretly, surreptitiously checking Google every five seconds to make sure. <laughs> that my that my explanation of his math homework is correct, and I was wrong ninety percent of the time. That's hilarious. And he was telling me, "No, no, Dad, it's not how you do it, Dad." But hey, it's like a, getting a second education. It's like now. getting a second degree. Yeah, all the times you didn't. It's pay not attention. a master's. It's like a minor's. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I got like a middle school like equivalency degree now. So you have had a, a really incredible voiceover career. How did you get into voiceover in the first place? It it was complete luck. I was doing a show in New York. I had gotten my first professional show. I was doing Tony and Tina's Wedding off Broadway in New York. That got me my first commercial agent who came to see me in the show and said, great, we want to work with you. And by the way, you know, it was Don Buckwald and Associates, uh, and uh, they take me around the office, and this is our voiceover department, and have you ever done voiceover? I, said, I don't even know what that means. They said, well, we're going to send you out on some, and we'll see how you do. And they sent me out on a commercial, and it was like for like some pizza commercial, and I didn't know what I was doing. And of course, I booked the job, and it like opened my world up to something that I had never in a million years. And then I didn't book another job for like three years straight. You know? <laughs> but you know, you get that first one. It's like a, it's like being a professional gambler. You know, you hit that first slot machine payoff, yeah. and you just think, well, just one more quarter. I'm just gonna book one more quarter. No joke. I had almost the exact same experience with acting. I was behind camera for most of my life, and then. Jolene said, you know, you really should get in front of camera. You're very charismatic and funny. And so on a fluke, I put a profile up on LA Casting. I got an audition uh, for a Trident gum commercial, my first ever national commercial audition. And I booked the job. I did the audition at home, self-tape, jumping yeah. around the living room. And then I booked a national commercial on my first audition. But they did not, as you said, I did not then book a bunch of other national commercials. Yeah. It was like a dry spell for a while. It's a strange thing about truly being free. And I guess this is what, you know, we, we these natural instincts that we have or these the natural parts of our personality that we tend to ignore or cover up or try to do all this other stuff with, when you get back to what that es essence of you is, I think that for voiceover, for acting, for really for anything, it's, it's, it's amazing what happens. Mm -hmm. I just had something, I got a call, I was traveling, coming back from New York. I'm at uh, Terminal 5 at JFK. I get a call from my agent. We need you to put yourself on tape for this film. They need tapes by the end of the day. I said, well, I'm literally getting on a plane right now. They said, well, it has to be in in the next couple hours. And I was like, well, I can either forget it, just say this is not for me. I could go in the bathroom. By the way, they wanted me to sing as part of the audition. Oh. So I, I thought, okay, well, I can go in a stall. And then I thought, if I was in a stall at JFK and the man next to me started to serenade me, I think there would be a problem. So I just made the decision on the fly. I stuck my phone up in the air and I just sang out right in the middle of Terminal 5 and belted out a song and people were walking by. And of course, it's New York, so nobody cared. And don't you know, I booked the job. That's awesome. All the all the preparation, all the lighting and what we go through and we put ourselves through the ringer. We got to get it perfect. Just, just go to JFK and put yourself on tape and you can work. I have a buddy who's been working in the business for about 30 years and he has me help him with his self tapes every now and again. And I love it because he comes over <laughs> and, you know, it's one light, one camera, quick thing in and out. He will, he will miss lines. He'll say the wrong words. And I'll say, don't you want to go back and get, he's like, nope, they don't care. They just want to see the essence of the character and that you get, and, and in 10 seconds, they know if they like you or not. So just send it off. I shit you not. This guy books so much work. It, we, there's some truth to that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you do need to prepare so you know the character, which is what he does. Right. 
So this is very interesting, very interesting. So for people who don't know, I mean, you've done a ton of video game work, and I'm, I think the listeners would find it fascinating to hear you talk about what it's like to actually voice a character in a, in a video game, what it's like to sit behind a microphone in a recording session. Can you give a brief kind of description of what it's like behind the scenes? Sure. Um, well, you know, the big thing, like as we were just talking about, there is something to be said. And now, you know, with video games, the great thing is you're not limited to your your physical uh, looks, you are free to create, you know, these wild, you can be an alien, you can be three inches tall, 30 feet tall, as long as you can get that through. But there, there has to be some part of you, some essence of the character that you can sustain. And that's the big thing, which maybe people don't realize with these video games, we record them over weeks, sometimes years, where a ses- you'll do a session and then they'll call you back literally a year later. Okay, we're going to pick up and you have to kind of have some sort of muscle memory. You have to have a recall of what you did, mm. how you did it, and to be able to keep a consistency with the character so that, obviously, so there's no yeah. disparity. And uh, when we were doing, for example, we were doing um, Mafia 2, where I was playing Vito Scaletta, and it was a, you know, it was a New York guy, for, you know, and he was about my age. He even looked like me. Like, it was, it was uh, of all the things I've done, it was the closest that I would say to my natural state of being, and yet... I found from, and in this the process overall, it probably took about a year and a half, close to two years. And they did play me stuff from my first sessions and then later sessions. And I was actually shocked that there was, to my ears anyway, there was some difference that I wasn't as consistent as I thought I was. And I actually had to make adjustments along the way. But you learn as you go too. Uh-huh. And you also have to, you know, sometimes I'll create something in an audition situation and you go, oh, I can pitch my voice up this 10 octaves or I can come down into a gravity. Guess what? If you book the job, you have to do that for <laughs> four hours, hours an hour, yeah. and uh, you know you better be able to sustain that because if you get there on the day and you can't, well, they're going to be a little cross with you. Yes. yes. Now they have uh, they have uh, changed things a bit that if they they'll alert you if it's vocally stressful if you're going to be uh, dying from I call them bullet catchers if you're going to be uh, if you're going to be doing a lot of screaming agonizing death scenes they have to alert you ahead of time so you can prepare yourself that's how do you prepare for that you really can't <laughs> that's the truth <laughs> you can't you can there are tricks you can do to protect your voice obviously a lot of people know you speak from your diaphragm not your throat you do a lot of breath work but basically if you're going to be screaming in pain there's no real way to drink a lot of tea <laughs> drink a lot of tea with lemon and honey daniel dear don't don't stress your voice what's been your favorite vo job so far um i've, I've had a lot uh vito vito was a lot of fun because it got to really tell a story a lot of times you're coming in like i've done a lot of military games you know playing you know soldiers and pilots and it's fun and it's it's fun to be part of the world but there's no but you're not the art character art. The, yeah. this character in particular they really wrote into his backstory, his life, how he, you know, his relationship to his family, to his friends. And it was, and we also had the opportunity, which is pretty rare, myself and the two other main uh, actors, we actually got to be in a room together Uh. for the first few weeks as they were fleshing the story out and really play off each other live on mic. Now, from a technical perspective, are you guys behind different glass walls and whatnot for they, sound? They or? didn't do it that way. We, we, we were pretty much lined up in a row. All they ask is that you leave a little space Except for uh, there were specific scenes where they allowed us to overlap a little bit, but that was by design. But usually you just you do a line, you do the next line, you keep it in the clear, which is unusual. Most of the time um, you're doing it by yourself and you're just reading yeah. what the other characters would be saying and you know popping in your own lines and then they mix it all together. So like when you have a acting audition, when you're reading and when you're doing the character in the vocal booth. Mm-hmm and you're interacting with another person, is there a reader just in your headphones that's giving you, it's feeding you all the other lines? Uh, yeah, usually the director, uh, as you're going through the script, because, because again, you're also, most of the time, you're doing the script very much out of sequence. So they'll break it up. They'll say, okay, this is um, this is in-game play. So, all right, here now uh, you're standing and the guy's not paying attention to you. So you'll be giving, say, a list of commands that you the character could say. Hey, look at me. Come here. Where are you going? Stuff like that. They'll do that in a row. Okay, now you're interacting with this character and their director would maybe feed you the line before so that you have something to play off of. Mm. And then they'll do sections which may be cutscenes where animatics, where it's like a real cinematic uh, uh, story and you're, you're, you're usually following something already visual, maybe rendered. It really depends. And then they'll save the vocally stressful stuff for the end so you can blow yourself out and then go home and cry. <laughs> <laughs> 
How long is each session on average? Generally four hours. If uh, if it's vocally stressful, they'll maybe cut it to two hours. Hmm. Uh, it also depends on how much material it is, but they'll they'll generally get you for the full four. That's really cool. So let's talk about Channeling the King. You have a one-man Elvis show that you wrote, correct? I co-wrote it, yeah. yeah. Um, it was created by uh, our, my partner, Bob Watman and uh, Denise Fennell. It's the story of an insurance salesman from Long Island <laughs> who channels Elvis Presley. Well, now you had mentioned earlier that your mom loved Elvis and mm-hmm. the Beatles. Is that where the inspiration for this came from? Uh, it did factor into the show. The The inspiration for the show, uh, I was saying my, uh, my friend Bob, who, who came up with the idea for the show, was just an Elvis fan. And obviously there's a lot of Elvis tribute acts right now where you can go and hear a guy who kind of sounds like Elvis, kind of looks like Elvis, and you kind of experience what it He was thinking more like, what would happen if... Elvis were back today, like, what would that be like if he was still alive? You know, if if he could talk to you now, what would that look like? What would that sound like? And he had this idea of just this unwitting guy who is channeling and he doesn't know why. But we, mm-hmm. in in creating the show, then we started to discover, okay, well, what what's really happening? What's What's going on? And we created the rules of the world of what happens. And what we were hopefully trying to do was tell a story which involves this guy, Jesse Haldeman, who's just this nice guy from Long Island, whose mom met Elvis at Madison Square Garden in 1972. And the payoff of the show is he may or may not be the Elvis's son. Elvis. son. <laughs> is he, he could be his son. He could be out of his mind. We don't really know. We don't get a definitive answer. Well, we kind of do, but it's Jesse's, it's always Jesse's interpretation, but Elvis comes to life hmm. and interacts now with the audience. And to my mom, we I remember exactly where I was when Elvis died. Mm. I was with my mom. We were on vacation. And I remember the setting and the surrounding. And I used all of that. And I put it in the show. Oh, wow. So as Jesse, I'm telling this story about where I was when Elvis died. And that's a true story. And my mom was in the audience and she saw the show for the first time. And I couldn't help but hear her go, that really happened. <laughs> this is really true. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. So, how often do you get to do the show? We've been uh, we've been touring it now. Uh, it's it's built to be a touring production. Basically, um, it's myself with a very shiny costume and uh, some props, and we go on the road and we go into these theaters. And it's with technology now. The whole show is on a laptop, and mm-hmm. everything is projections. And as long as the theater has a a screen and a projector and a sound system, we're good to go. And so we've been. Talk about traveling. We've been to places that I never, ever would have visited before, such as Alamogordo, New Mexico. Do tell. Which is famous for being the uh, site of the first nuclear test. Wow. White Sands uh, Missile Range. How, how, how was it? Uh, very hot. <laughs> Not just from the radiation. It was just hot. <laughs> no, it was actually lovely. Uh, it's We went out. There's this white sand desert, mm-hmm. which is exactly what it sounds like. And you'd think, well, that's pretty boring. It's breathtakingly beautiful. And you can go out into the deep, deep into the desert with this white gypsum sand and it's people sled, they go sledding on it. And wow. they, it's very magical, very peaceful. And you'd be amazed how much life is actually there growing. You don't feel that. tingly afterwards. A little bit, <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. But talk, it was a wonderful experience. We, we go into this tiny little town. We were there for, you know, two days. I went and checked out some of the local places. So I got on stage and as in character, I was saying, I, I had this wonderful Mexican meal at this restaurant right next door. Do you guys know it? And of course, they all know it because there's one Mexican restaurant in town. And and we had a conversation for a good 15 minutes about their little town. And they people went crazy. They went bananas that, you That's know, cool. Elvis was there in their little town and he, they had gone to... <laughs> Hang out in the desert and, and you then get to sing food. a bunch of Elvis tunes and there's a lot of there's a lot of music. It's very talk about vocally stressful. It's uh, it's you know it's an hour and a half of me playing two characters back and forth doing the playing Elvis singing playing guitar you know singing live mm. singing to tracks going out into the audience kibitzing with people. It's um, it's a lot of fun and uh, I'm usually very 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 tired afterwards. So do you do this every year? We uh, we were going out. Uh, we were going out a couple times a month. Uh, we're on a little break now. I'm I'm on a different um, job right now. I'll be going to San Francisco 
looking for another play. But uh, after that, we're back on the road. What is your drink of choice? Uh, vodka rocks with a little twist of lime. Why? Because I like it. Is there a story? <laughs> did you did you you know first learn that drink from someone somewhere on the road or your dad or? My dad was a big martini guy. Hmm. Actually, my grandfather was a big martini guy. Dry martini up with olives, and that was my drink for quite a while. Kind of streamlined it a little over the years. You know what? We can hold off on the vermouth. Just just give me a vodka rocks, nice, with a little squeeze of lime. It's just one of those drinks. It just it just fits. Sometimes it fits you. I was never a tequila guy. Mm. Puts me right to sleep. Is Buzz Rick any different than regular Rick? Buzz Rick, uh, the volume knob gets a little broken, <laughs> but it's pretty much the same guy. Just broken volume knob. Well, one of the questions I love to ask uh, that involves drinking is if you could sit down in a room with anyone, a single person from history, alive or dead, for the entire history of the human race, and have your vodka drink with them, and they'll have their drink of choice, and you could talk to them for four hours, who would it be, and what do you think you'd ask them about? I think I would have, I'd have one more drink with my grandpa. Mm. What's something you think you'd ask him? Gosh, all the, probably all the things that I never even thought to ask, you know, when I was with him, you know, or around him or, you know, just, uh, he was just one of the most, uh, one of the most beautiful, charming, wonderful men, you know, uh, I'm fortunate to still have my mom and dad. Um, but, uh, my grandparents, you know, that was, that was a big, big loss. And I think if I could sit down with anybody, either one of them or both of them, ideally, you know, I would probably have four hours with them over Leonardo da Vinci or anybody else, you know, and I'm sure they'd be, have be very fascinating too, but just that if it's, if it's going to be sharing a vodka, it would be with grandpa. That's great. How much has travel been a part of your actual career besides the, the Elvis show? Quite a bit. I w- I've been very lucky over the years to get some nice, some nice first class. First time I ever flew first class was, uh, courtesy of the Screen Actors Guild, because... <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is nice. You could get used to this. I got to travel back and forth, obviously back and forth to New York quite a bit. I uh, got to travel to uh, Toronto to work, all over the country. And your personal life, have you done overseas travel? Yes. I've uh, been, uh, been to Spain, been to Morocco, uh, Italy a few times. We went... Um, it's always nice to, when you travel too, to take... Uh, I got the... the the great experience to share Italy with my girlfriend, Denise, uh, for the first time. She had never been. She's half Italian. And we had the opportunity to go. And she said, there's one thing that I really want to do when we go to Rome. I really want to see the Pope. And I went, ugh. Because I just thought, this is going to be a nightmare. We've got to stand in line. It's going to be a thing. But of course, being a good boyfriend, I went, sure, honey, that sounds great. We can make that happen. As it turns out, maybe one of the highlights of my travel ever. Really? Yeah, and I'll tell you why. We have time? Yeah, yeah, of course. You gotta catch a bus? No. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so there's a way to do it. Here's a little travel tip. Uh, anybody traveling to Rome, when the Pope uh, does his general audience in St. Peter's Square, you can get tickets ahead of time. There's the American Church in Rome, and you can kind of email them and ask uh, for tickets, and you can get tickets ahead of time. That You can also get them while you're there, but good to get things done ahead of time. We got our tickets, we picked them up, and they give you a whole breakdown of how it's going to go. You have to show up very early in the morning. There's St. Peter's, of course, is huge, huge, mm-hmm. huge. And there's now, of course, there's metal detectors and security lines that you have to wait in. Got our tickets, got up very early in the morning, one espresso, not nearly enough to keep me awake, but, you know, we were motivated. So a little backstory. Uh, Denise also is an actor and travels in a one-woman show called Late Night Catechism, where she comes out in character as a nun. And over the years doing this show, she has gotten quite an affinity for her fellow sisters. And somehow <laughs> they recognize something in her. Some There's some nun radar that goes off. So now here we are in Rome, waiting in line, 6 a.m. to see the Holy Father. And don't you know, a gaggle of nuns. Is that how you say Is it a gaggle of nuns? It is now. A flock of nuns? <laughs> Let's say gaggle comes walking by, and Denise starts chatting them up. Well, don't you know, the sisters took a shine to her, gave her a rosary, said, you know what, why don't you come in with us? So here we are now, following the the gaggle of nuns into St. Peter's, and of course they had like primo seating right up front. So now here we are, basically in the front row, and now the sun comes up over St. Peter. It's now full of people, people as far as the eye can see. The Pope comes in in his Pope mobile, and he's going through the crowd, and people are going crazy. It's, and it was the most beautiful thing. And he got up to speak, and it was 
it was as if he, as if we're talking to each other now. Mm. This is how he spoke to the crowd, and it was the simplest message and the most beautiful experience. And I, I said I would take that with me forever, and it may be even so- something that I would never have done. Yeah, you know. I think that the most profound travel experiences I've ever had were things that I didn't plan on doing. One of my favorite experiences was uh, when I was in Israel, I decided to go up to Masada mm-hmm. and I, I had never been. I'd always wanted to see it as a kid. And it looked like it wasn't going to happen at some point because I was there for a, a friend's wedding. We were so busy. And finally, at some point, I just said, dude, I got to separate from you and go do my own thing. And I just randomly walked into Jerusalem, found a rental car place. This is before mobile phones, mm-hmm. by the way. And... I rented a car, drove out there. I found some people at a at a like a museum there that helped me get a, a reservation. They spoke they spoke Hebrew and I didn't speak Hebrew, so they got me all set up. And then I did the hike. Um, I didn't do the cable car. I wanted to hike it, you know, old school style. Mm-hmm. So you start at four o'clock in the morning, and I get up. I got up early, made my way there, did the hike, and I, and I hike, finally get to the top of this thing. And you look out, and the sun is rising over the Jordanian mountains and the dead sea is all reflecting the sunrise and it was just one of the most beautiful profound experiences and i i just did it randomly i was like i'm gonna go do this thing you know Mm -hmm. so i I get it it's cool well you have to be you have to be open to it and you never know sometimes you'll you'll meet somebody or you'll talk to somebody and it'll Mm -hmm. it'll open up something that you that you weren't expecting at all yeah have you ever had to overcome any kind of challenge traveling we uh i remember uh, i remember traveling Early on to Italy, Italians are known for many things. Punctuality, not really one of them. <laughs> um, I remember flying, it was, and we were with we were traveling with my whole family, and we had we were on our way to Italy. We were at JFK, getting ready to leave, and we were there very very early, like three hours before our flight. And we get to check in, and there's all these people, and people are screaming and yelling. And I remember my mother was like, "Ugh, these people, they're." So rude, these Italians, you know. I mean, we're Italian. We get up, make our way to the front of the counter, and there's the lady, and um, we said, we're here to check in for our flight. And she goes, oh, that, that flight left. We, we, what, do you, what do you mean? We're, we're three hours early. They say, yeah, well, there was, there was people that were left over from another flight, so we just put them on, and that flight's gone. At which point, we became the loudest people <laughs> in the room. I remember vividly my grandfather going, over the counter, getting somebody by the shirt collar, pulling them onto our side. Yeah, there was it was it was full melee. Uh, needless to say, we did get on a flight wow. right quick after that. But uh, <laughs> and this this said to be when you were a kid. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, it's so funny how things have changed. Yeah, that's hilarious. I'm pretty sure everybody was smoking and yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always joke about that that they had these quote unquote smoking areas of the plane, and it's like yeah. You're in a fucking tube. Right. You know? <laughs> Is there somewhere that you want to travel that you haven't been yet? A lot of places. Um, What's at the top of your list? I don't know that I have a top. I, you know, it's funny. Like, we always think, we always thinking outside, but there's so much of the country that I still haven't seen. The one great thing about being on tour is going into these small cities yeah. and towns that you just would never... I've been to, you know, Arkansas, and we're talking about New Mexico, and, and uh, you know, th- these are just places that wouldn't be on anybody's itinerary, but sometimes... You find these great little hidden little gems. gems yeah. yeah, but I, I mean, I would love to see. I would love to see Japan, of course. I would love to see. Um, I would love to see more of Europe. Uh, I've never been to France. France, but I don't speak. I don't speak French, so uh, you don't have to. to. I heard it's a problem if you don't speak French. No, the French are actually a lot nicer than people think they are. They just really want people to have a little bit of respect for their culture. And so you know, if you learn in French, part of anglais, and you just you know. Pardon, parlez-vous anglais? It's all you have to say. You know, excuse me. Can you speaking. say that again, but really soft? Pardon, parlez-vous anglais. Oh, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rick, how do you, a man in his 50s, you're a father. Uh, you're dare inter- you, sir. Yes, that's <laughs> you're <true>. an entertainer. <laughs> uh, how do you look at life differently now in your 50s than, say, when you were in your 20s, 30s, 40s? Have your priorities shifted drastically? Not really? 100%. I think the goal now is to be home. Mm. You know? I think the goal when you're in your 20s is to just be out anywhere but where you are. And now the goal is just to go home because that is where the true happiness is, you know, the people that you're with, not where you are. Yeah. And I think that was a realization that you know, I don't think any 20-year-old would necessarily have that perspective, but... Uh, well, because they haven't been out there yet. Right. And to, you know, 
to have kids. I said, you know, and I tell all my friends, I said, I highly recommend it. If you want to lose your ego, if you want to really, you know, have a couple kids, because that'll, that'll take your ego right out of your body forever. Because now everything I do, I say, well, this is for them, you know? Yeah. So I don't have any hangups anymore about back in when I was 20, I can't do that. How that, that would compromise my, oh, shut up, yeah. you know? Now, are you at all looking forward to, not, not in a selfish way, but when your children are grown and they're on their own and they live in their own apartments and now it's just you again and you and Denise, um, are you looking forward to that part of life to kind of rediscovering who you might be? Sure. I, I you know, I hope that, that I'm, I'm expecting cause my kids are entering the teenage years, I'm expecting they're going to be little assholes for a little while. And then I hope that they'll circle around and that we'll all be friends again at some point and that we could travel together and enjoy each other. But I already told, I told them right to there. I told my son right to his face. I'm like, you're going to be a little asshole for a guy. And he's like, no dad. I go, yeah, you are. Cause I was. Yeah. And it's going to happen. It's genetic. It's so, yeah. so besides children, which is an obvious answer, what are you most passionate about in life? I really do love what I do. I know that's cliche, but, um, not if it's true. Well, I, it, it, you know, I, I really do enjoy it. I, I enjoy the work. I enjoy the process. I enjoy, I enjoy being on stage, but I also enjoy making my little voices in my, you know, my home studio. I think I get, I get pleasure out of it. And I, you know, you hope that that comes through and you hope that that's sustainable, that you sustain it for your whole life. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I like, I enjoy doing a lot of other things. But, uh, well, I was going to ask you, if you didn't act, what would you do for a living? You know, it's one of those, you, you have those thoughts, you know, all the time. Because, <laughs> you know, every day in the entertainment is you go, God, I'm, I'm worthless. I don't, I'm never going to work again. I better, I better get my real estate license, you know, or something, <laughs> something that hopefully won't be soul crushing. I, 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 don't, I don't know. As long as it doesn't involve too much math. I'm not very good at, as we've previously discussed, I'm not really good at math. So fine. I'd have to have my kids along with me to do long adventures. Long book, division. Long division. <laughs> what was your favorite childhood book? Hmm. I enjoy. I, you know what? I uh, I remember reading The Hobbit, Tolkien, Tolkien, and being very captivated, and then trying to get through the Silmarillion and couldn't quite figure out what he was talking about. But I revisited The Hobbit when, with my kids, and I found it just as amazing as I remember it as a kid. Did you like the movie? Or movies, whatever the yeah, trilogy. I did. Uh, I'm talking about the Peter Jackson, not the weird, creepy cartoon from the seventies. It was creepy. It was creepy. Gave me it was, all, it was, it was like very red. I remember being very red, <laughs> hued. I don't know what that was all about. If you were going to tell your younger self anything, if you go back in time and meet young Rick, let's say you're, I don't know, 15, 18 years old, whatever, what would you say to your younger self right now? Do what you say, say what you mean, and try not to be a dick about it. Sound advice. When you're traveling and you go somewhere new, what's your favorite way to get acquainted with a new place you've never been before? Well, there's, there's a lot to be said for just getting lost. But I, I do, I have to say, I miss having a nice map because there's something about orienting, uh, orientating or orienting. Sure. Yeah. Orienting would be as if you're I in, have a degree in, in English. You would think I'd know the answer to that question. Wait, hold on. We'll do this live orienting. on camera. Let, anyway, let, let's, let's you look that up, up and I'll, 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 I will. I'll, 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 we'll talk over you. Should we play some music to go with this? Or, you should <laughs> sing to me. Yeah. But there's something about looking at a map and getting an overview of where you are and getting your perspective getting a few landmarks and then being able to kind of tell, to navigate yourself with the general idea of, I need to go in that direction. And I like that. I like to have a kind of general idea of where we are. I remember, I remember first coming to LA. Go ahead. What it is? Orienting or orientating. Orienting is an adjective positioning with respect to a reference system or determining your bearings physically or intellectually. Orientating is a synonym for orienting. You can use orientating instead of an adjective orienting. So both. So you were saying I was correct twice. So you are. You are so correct. It's <laughs> unfucking believable. <laughs> I remember first coming to LA and people. I was trying to get my bearings in LA and they were like, "Well, the mountains are north." I'm like. There's fucking mountains everywhere. What are you talking about? <laughs> All north? around on both sides. What about? What are you? Uh, yeah. Sorry, I just did not look at my list of questions. Hold on. I was so excited about orientating. Orientating. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I get to orientate myself back to my questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll tell you that yourself. We got that one. Okay. Uh, is there anything you don't like about travel? They are making they're making it difficult these days. They I are. Have to say. They it's, really are. It's getting. How about the thing with the, the the guy punching the seat back now? That just happened. The guy there was a woman reclined her seat on a flight recently, and the guy behind her didn't like it and proceeded to punch the back of her seat for the entire flight. And the you didn't read that whole thing. No, it was a I whole this. big to do. And then the president of the airline chimed in and said, "Well, I fly all the time, and I don't recline my seat. Well, why do you make them recline then? He should have been punching her seat. He should not have been punching her seat. What a dick. Right. Yeah, I mean that's but this is the thing. They give you, you know, 
four inches of room and it's, yeah. it's getting a little much. Oh, but if you'll pay the $70 fee to have sure. more room, which is still less than we used to have. Right. I showed Jolene a photograph recently, actually, of a, the inside of a plane in 1975 versus the inside of a plane today. And what most people don't realize, people, check this out, where you now get into a plane and there's three seats, that used to be two. Mm-hmm. So they took the space that was two seats and they made it into three, and then they squished them a little closer together. It's why the windows don't line up to the seats anymore, because mm-hmm. it used to be one set of seats per window. Right. So they are squishing us like sardines, charging us more money, and then they they give you four more inches of leg room if you want to pay the extra, you know, two three hundred dollars. It's it's absolute extortion. And it seems crazy because if you if you're to believe the uh, statistics, we're also getting larger as a population. We're mm-hmm. getting larger, and our seats are getting smaller. Yeah, it's cruel. But it you is. can always pay $1,400 for a first-class ticket one yeah. way. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully I'll book some more work and I don't have to <laughs> worry about somebody else. <laughs> have somebody else foot the bill. We're going to change subjects to one of my favorite things to talk about, which is food. Yes. How much of your heritage is part of your food choices? I'm, I'm Italian. It's, 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 That's what I'm saying. It's so like, you, it's like it... oxygen. You, don't, you, you, can't, you can't even have the conversation separately. It's just... Do you know how to make red sauce from scratch? Of course. Okay. Of course. Uh, I'm going to hold you to that, and you have to make me pasta sauce sometimes. <clears throat> but is, it, is your culture like so? You know, I grew up Jewish, right? And uh, you know, Jewish food is delicious, but it's also very heavy and can mm-hmm. be kind of, you know, like brisket and potatoes and all that stuff. So I don't actually eat. Jewish food that often. I don't go to delis that often. I still go, but Italian food for me is my is one of my all time favorites. Italian, Greek are like two of my favorite foods. I make Italian food all the time because I love it. So, uh, how much you know in your daily life do you still eat a lot of Italian food? And sure, and there is I think there is a, a misconception about it still about Italian food that uh, you know everybody looks at the Southern Italian, which tends to be a little heavier, you know, tomato sauce and cheese and pastas and pizzas, but it's not all that. I mean, sure. if in, in, in Abruzzi, it, you know, everything is getting a little more homogenized now, but it's, uh, Abruzzi was more of, you know, um, well, you know, lamb was available, so it's more, you'll find, uh, you know, roasted roasted meat and uh, maybe a little bit of pasta, fresh, uh, you know, it's more about vegetables and what's mm-hmm. what's in season. You go up north and it's, they hardly do, you know, they hardly do tomato sauce at all because they weren't growing them, you know, when the, when the, when the uh, cuisine was, you know, coming uh, around, it was all, what could you get? You yeah. Know? So they cook with more with butter up there. So what I love about Italian food is that you can have such a wide array mm. and uh, I never get tired of it. Big picture question. What does success in life look like to you? Boy, that is, that's a, that's a big one. I don't know. Happiness, just being happy, uh, you know, such a fleeting and arbitrary thing, but you yeah. know, yeah, I've, you know, I've, I've had no money. I've had some money in my life. I've had success. I've had some success. I've had very, very lean years and very prosperous years and, you know, it doesn't really seem to matter unless you have some sort of some sort of happiness that you can share with somebody else too. You know, yeah. if, and you know, I know it's a truism to say, well, if you're not happy with your own self, you can't make anybody else happy. But I see, you know, and in the entertainment business, it's hard. I see a lot of people that, even successful, that that just struggle with the day to day taking joy in anything. You know, yeah. and it's, uh, and I'm sure that's true for a lot of professions. I'm sure. You know, our friends that we know that are civilians that are just, you know, that are going out <laughs> slogging through some job, uh, you know, and, you know, I get it. You know, sometimes it's life can be monotonous, but. Well, and this brings up a, a really good question of uh, something I've been thinking about a lot lately, which is happiness versus contentment, hmm. because they're different. They're they're very different. And, and to me, and I don't care about the Webster's Dictionary definition of them. To me, the, the concept of the two is that contentment is the ability to look at your life, appreciate what you have. It doesn't mean you don't strive for more, but you appreciate what you have and it's enough. And you go, the world is beautiful. My kids are healthy. My life is good. I have my health. Thank God. Like I'm content. It's a good place to live from. Happiness is, oh man, I just, 
I just saw the best movie or I had a great conversation with my girlfriend or I had this meal that made me so happy. You know, it is a fleeting thing, like mm-hmm. you said, but we live in a culture nowadays that's like, you have to be happy, be happy all the time, be happy. Well, that's bullshit because you can't be happy 24 hours a day. The hum- human mind and the human soul are not designed for that. I would argue that you almost, that would make you almost great, a definition of being great. I mean, if you were that happy all the time, I would think there was something wrong with you. Yeah, I would think I crazy. commit at least five homicides in my head every day. <laughs> That's no exaggeration. And that's just going to the grocery store. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Especially going to the grocery store. <laughs> I killed three people on the way over here just now in my mind. But I think you have to, you have to allow yourself those, you know, crazy thoughts because then you can come around and go, okay, I guess life isn't so bad. Mm. Okay. I didn't kill that person today, yeah, yeah. even though he really deserved it. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we deny, we deny ourselves those things sometimes. And I think you have to let the... You have to let the big dog out to eat sometimes. Yeah, Jolene, that's a good, I like that. I'm going to quote you on that. Uh, <laughs> Jolene said the other day, she goes, if people knew my inner dialogue, oh. no one would be friends with me. I, I, w- I would be manacled. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Well, there's this great quote I read once that said, the difference between someone that's crazy and someone that's not is that a normal human being stands on escalator thinking to themselves, what would happen to that guy if I just pushed him down this escalator and the crazy person does it? Right. Yeah. So, but so in, so to your point, do you think that that happiness and contentment that it's possible to have those two on a consistent basis? And how do you how do you get there? I I have contentment on a fairly regular basis. I have happiness. Uh, I think that I have happiness more than the average person, only because I have worked very hard to create a life because you create it because c- that that has it. You know what I mean? Like I do. I'm very fortunate and blessed that the what I do for a living is something I really enjoy and I don't take it for granted. I try not to take it for granted that I have a lot of friends who don't, that they work at a job they hate, they're in a cube in a corporate office that they're just doing and they have to because they've got five kids to raise and the bills are piling up and they don't know another way. And But they used to dream of being a guitar player in a band or whatever, mm-hmm. you know. So, But by design, also... You know, I don't have children. Um, I don't have any kind of crazy weird. I've never done drugs in my life, so I don't have a drug habit or anything like that. So I have nothing that's pulling my money away except travel. And so it's, um, you know, I'm just very lucky, but it's also by design. So yes, I guess short answer, I have a relatively abundant amount of contentment and a good amount of fleeting happiness, you know? Right. And 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 while... And also homicidal thoughts on a fairly regular basis. Sure. <laughs> right. And that works for you. And somebody outside might go, oh, you know... He has a great life, but he doesn't have kids, you know, but but not everybody, but not everybody follows the same path, you know? And I do think that sometimes I think, especially after my dad died, I thought to myself, man, fuck, I didn't, there's nobody to carry on for me. There's no one to take care of me when I get old. I'm going to be stuck with, uh, hopefully my nieces and nephews will be kind enough to help. But if not, then I'm going to be in a home and, you know, those things bother me. And uh, I used to have dreams of what it would be like to you know, see my daughter or my son on their wedding day or things like that. And I, and I know I probably will never have those things, but I'd also have, there's 15 grandchildren in my family. So there's plenty of kids for me to help them support their dreams and be a part of their lives. And so I look forward to that, you know? Yeah. Well, speaking of children, your kids are about to be teenagers, but let's say 10 or 20 years from now, even, you know, 50 years from now, let's say you're, when you're gone, if they listen to this podcast, what would you want to say to them? Don't be stupid. Go, <laughs> don't be dumb. Go live your life. Go travel, play. Don't take yourself so seriously. Don't be dummies. I took myself so seriously when I was in my 20s. So serious. Me too. Big dummy. Yeah. Don't be dumb. That's funny. I, that's great. I love the simplicity of that. I, I also, in my 20s, everything was so dramatic. Oh. And one tear-filled fest oh to the next. And mm-hmm. I, I just wish that I had let go and just enjoyed life You know life why? Because more. we thought that was cool. We thought, oh, let me be the, let me be the, the twisted, the tortured, brooding, God, I'll be yeah. brooding. You know what? Brooding makes you dumb. Yeah. Don't be dumb. Dumb and miserable. Get up. And really not attractive when women figure out that you're just a loser. Right. Because they, because it, it, you always think, oh boy, they're you know, the hottest girls. They always go for these disaster guys. Guess what? They figure it out eventually. They figure people. it out eventually. Or not. But yeah. you know what? God bless you all. Go yeah. ahead. Go. Most of them figure it out. Most though. of them figure the smart it out. ones do. Plus, it's hard to brood for. 60 years it wears thin after a while <laughs> yeah because then the woman's going it's great that you're brooding but i have to eat so where's dinner because you know? when when does brooding turn into you're just a cranky old man yeah you know? exactly right around 35 35 i think yeah. is the cutoff yeah. yeah you know you start to go a little gray and you go you, you can't brood anymore you're not yeah, allowed no, to brood no you're too not too cool enough to yeah and throw away that leather jacket what right. you <laughs> yeah I, well i still got the leather jacket <laughs> 
Rick, the last thing we're going to do is a, a fun game that I like to play called 299 Philosophical and Life Questions with Moonbird. I have collected 299 Philosophical and Life Questions. I have the list in front of me. You get to pick two numbers from 1 to 299. Whew. And I'm going to ask you those two questions. What are your two numbers? 11 and 22. Okay. Number 11, what is the best compliment you've ever received? Boy, are you handsome. Do you want to tell the story? No, I don't know. <laughs> I was like, that was just I was, when he... I was projecting on what I would like to be told. Uh, okay. <laughs> I never, nobody's ever said that. I was going to say, that's just what I told him when he walked in the door today. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, well, the best compliment... I mean, having your kids look up, you just go, I love you, Dad. I mean, that's... I mean, there, there's just nothing better like when you... I don't even know if sometimes it's verbalized, but if you know you've done something, you know, for another person that they and that they truly appreciate it, I mean, what better compliment, you know, than a smile, even, yeah. you know, just thank you. It's not one of the best I've ever heard. It's it's not the best compliment I've, I've ever heard, but one of the best compliments I received recently was when a friend of mine who works in the business and is very, uh, like, kind of anal retentive and picky and doesn't compliment very easily, called me specifically to say, hey, I listened to your podcast and I got to say really nice. It sounds like NPR. And I was like, yes, if I can make you happy, mm -hmm. then I've achieved something. So that was cool. Not that it's about me. I just want to turn about me. From it. <laughs> you said, Come on. It's all about you. We all uh, <laughs> look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Well, it's not called memories of Pascal. Lenny. It's called memories of <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's a catchy you, title. Though. You just said, consider that. The, the, uh, was it 22? Was the next 22. one? 22. What is a relationship deal breaker for you? Ooh. Oh, this is going to be a very unpopular answer. It's okay. As long as it's the truth. No matter how much I adore you and how much of a nice person you might be. If you put the toilet paper on the bottom of the roll. You're out. <laughs> put the toilet paper on backwards. Pull from the bottom. What kind of person are you? <laughs> You're not a person. You're not a person. <laughs> you put it on the top so you can see where you're pulling. Exactly. What's wrong? <laughs> Matter with you. Uh, Stupid. <laughs> Didn't I say, don't be dumb? Don't be dumb. <laughs> yeah, I have a few. I mean, there would be, a, I'm going to, I'm going to lump them all into one. Uh, smoker would, would be a big one for me, even though I've over the years enjoyed an occasional cigar or I just, I, I can't do it. I can't deal with anybody that would be a smoker. And I, I couldn't take anybody that was, um, God bless them. There's a lot of them out here in LA now, vegan, dairy, gluten, non-fat, mocha just eat a sandwich and be quiet <laughs> we take i take so much pleasure in a, in a great meal and a glass of wine and yeah i try to be healthy and you know and denise and i we try to eat healthy and be healthy and encourage each other to do so but we also you know and if you we want to if we want to split really we want to split a pizza in bed we will yes absolutely and, and that to me for our lifestyle and our life together it's something we truly enjoy yeah and if i couldn't share that with somebody i don't think that i really could and to all the vegans out there and the gluten-free people and stuff like that. Have a sandwich. That, <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> I mean, have a sandwich. But besides that. Uh, no, I mean, the thing is. No, I is, respect. Listen, I respect anybody that's trying to live a healthy life. And if absolutely. that's your, if that's your you know, way to do it, great. More and power to And the thing is, you. I want to make it clear. You're not saying, I want to go murder all the vegans. You're saying, <laughs> you're no, saying, <laughs> only on days that end in Y. No, you're saying that this is my preference. As yeah. someone who is vegan might well, say. No, but you asked about a relationship. So yeah, yeah, to yeah. me, that was part of it. But but if I had someone sitting here who was a vegan, they might say, you know, look, for me, a deal breaker would be someone who's not vegan because it's very important to my lifestyle. We yeah. like to sit in bed and eat paper together, whatever, you know. Sure. Uh, but but no, no, seriously, have, you know, so we just respect each other's views. Sure, I and I have friends, know, yeah. I, and I have I have friends that are, you know, that are, you know, completely, you know, vegan and dairy-free and, you know, barely touch alcohol and everything. And but and it's fine. You know, they come over yeah. and they bring their little, you know, bag of sprouts or whatever. And, you know, <laughs> and I have a big bowl of pasta and a glass of wine and, you know, we have a nice conversation yeah. and it's all mm -hmm. good. I don't think you can live in LA and not have friends that are vegan, honestly. Yeah. I think it's kind of a requirement. Yeah. It's, they, it's like, in fact, they, they're, they're doing a new program where you, if you get off the plane, they'll actually assign you a vegan. <laughs> yes. His <laughs> name is Jonah. He lives in Silver Lake. Yeah. <laughs> right. And that's where our original episode ended. I reached out to Rick just the other day to ask him how things have been since the COVID pandemic started. Rick, thanks for coming back to the show. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. So obviously a lot's changed since we first spoke. And I'm wondering how has the pandemic affected you so far, both as an actor and as a father? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, on the professional level, and I'm sure a lot of people are, are feeling the pain right now, um, 
you know, the, the industry as a whole has really shut down. I mean, I was, uh, I was up in San Francisco when it first started. I, was, I had started work on a play, and uh, that uh, cruise ship that was full of COVID that was circling off San Francisco Bay, that was just happening. Oh, wow. Uh, this was back in early March, and, you know, nobody was really talking about it yet. But being up there, I got a kind of early warning about what was happening. And when I got back to L.A., it was just just starting. And, um, you know, fortunately, the voiceover world is still going, although there's been a lot of changes there, too. Uh, one of the biggest agencies in town, my agent, William Morris Endeavor, close their doors wow. uh, to the scale voiceover department. So uh, that was my longest relationship ever. <laughs> and typically came crashing to an end. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, what about as a dad with your kids and stuff? Have there been major changes for you? Sure. I mean, homeschooling. How's that going? I mean, in the, in the earlier podcast, you mentioned your math difficulties. So <laughs> Yeah, that hasn't improved. <laughs> no, uh, uh, I mean, they they adapted remarkably quickly. I mean, they're used to the technology. They embraced the technology. They were happy not to have to put on pants to go to school. Uh, but, you know, it's a big it's a big ask for anybody to to teach at home. I have so much more respect for not that I didn't already, but I have so much more respect for teachers in general. Yeah. How do you feel about them going back to in-person classes in parts of the country? If they feel that they can keep everybody safe more power to you. Uh, here in LA, they said straight up, we're starting school, but we're starting from home. Nobody's mm -hmm. coming in because yeah. we're not ready. And I and I respect that. And I think there's just too many people here to do that. The risk is way too high. And kids are dirty. And know? kids are filthy dirty to begin with. Yeah. yeah. I think it was easier when we were just dirty all the time. Yeah. We should go back to that. Just everyone be dirty. Yeah. So let's talk about George Floyd. I know it's been a little while and the protests have gone on and there's Portland now with all that kind of stuff. How do you feel as a as a person in the world about everything that's happened. I mean, that's a boy, you're not you're not lobbing softballs today, are yeah, you? No, I figured we covered the fun stuff earlier. Let's get to the meat. Yeah. It, it's 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 such a tricky subject, you know, uh so many people are so directly affected by this. I mean, and let me ask you, is there diversity in your part of the business in voiceover that you know? Of? You know, I always felt that entertainment was one of those fields where talent was talent and it didn't matter if you were black, white, gay, trans, you know, uh, any, any, all were welcome. You know, if, if you were talented, you, there was, a, there was a, a wide acceptance. You know, I was exposed to it very early on in my career. You know, a lot of, you know, my coworkers and, and, and ended up being close friends were gay. And, and that was something that I was not familiar with at all growing up, you know, in suburban Long Island. I mean, I'm sure there were just I wasn't aware of it. So I find that entertainment has kind of led the way as far as that goes. But yeah, there's still, I mean, I know there was a lot of, of backlash just recently about, um, you know, The Simpsons, you know, uh, and some of the other, uh, The Cleveland Show, where white actors, voice actors, were stepping away from their roles because they were playing minority characters and they no longer felt that it was appropriate. And, you know, if, and a lot of the casting people have said, look, we don't, you know, we're not, we're not paying attention to who's submitting for the, we just hear, we just hear it. You know, it's it's one of the most colorblind parts of the entertainment industry because you're really not seeing the person, you're only hearing them. So if they can play mm. the role, if they fit the role, but that being said, I think it's time for it's certainly time for more diversity and more and more people to have a shot at at the work, um, whatever work there is. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think the biggest thing here is is opportunity. I think people need to be given equal just opportunity. Just the opportunity, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not favoritism, but just opportunity, sure. Jordan Peterson, whether you love him or hate him, he said equality of opportunity doesn't guarantee equality of outcome. And I think that's something that we need to address. But I think that the point, whether you agree with him or disagree with him, the point is that the opportunity does need to be equal. The opportunity for people sure. does need to be there for anyone who's willing to step up and take a chance. And that know? was the, the promise of the American dream, which was, you know, equal opportunity for all. It doesn't always work out that way. You know, yeah. and life isn't always fair. You know, certainly our business is not always fair. But yeah, equal opportunity for all would be a beautiful thing. Agreed. I will say that, you know, I have to, you know, I have to give my kids, you know, their their school is very, um, you know, it's very diverse. And they're growing up, at least to my eyes, you know, being not only aware of what racism is, but not engaging in it, mm. being being appalled by it at a very, very young age and not engaging in it. And it's kind of... I, I hope that this is the sign of the future where, you know, 
the next generation will will be more sensitive to what what this issue is. Well, and as a father, let me ask you, are you encouraged by what you see in the younger generation that you feel they are much more accepting and tolerant than even our generation was? I think so. Is? I think so. I think because because they're exposed to it, because they're, you know, it's being talked about, not just not just at school, but at home. You know, these are subjects that were not discussed openly, not in my house anyway. Mm. You know, it wasn't, you know, it just wasn't something you talked over over dinner. Mm. And now it is. And so that's a good thing. Yeah. Because it, all, it starts with that. It starts with just conversation, understanding, you know, questions, you know, answering questions. When people ask me about these global concepts, I always tell them that, fundamentally at the core, I just really believe that if we're going to move forward as a species, I personally believe we can only do so together. I don't believe that it's about one thing or another uh, or, or one group of people and this group of people. I think we have to learn how to actually love each other, all of us together, and as a human race, unite together to move forward to the future so we can solve climate problems and financial problems and whatever. Um, I don't ask others to agree with me, but I'm curious if you do. It's a worthy goal, you know, love one another. It's very simple. You know, at the very least, love yourself enough to understand that without cooperation, we're individually doomed, if nothing else, you know, <laughs> because we do. We have to. There, there's no question that we have to all work together to save. And the planet, I, I love when people say, oh, we have to save the planet. Planet's going to be fine. You know, in, if, if human beings, if we exterminate ourselves in, in, in a couple hundred years, the planet will be just fine. Yeah. When humans step out of the way, nature will, the planet will be fine. We're the ones that need to look out for ourselves. And I think that was a, that might have been the realization too. During the pandemic, if there was one positive thing to come from it was, wow, look what happens when we step away. The air quality in LA was the cleanest it's ever been. There was no traffic. It was lovely for a minute. Now, of course, it's all back to, you know. Yeah. Rick, <laughs> another thing I'm really passionate about is perspective. I often in the podcast talk about when you've lived a life where you've seen a, a series of wars or diseases or things that have ravaged humanity, then when the next one comes along, you tend to think, okay, I mean, this isn't the end of the world. It's just another in a series of things we have to learn to get through together. Uh, what, how, do, how do you feel about that when you look at the world and you see some of the younger people, you know, really scared and, and afraid of this is the worst thing ever. And maybe it's not the worst thing ever. It's just a, a bad thing. You know, unfortunately, until you live through something, you really, truly don't understand that. I remember hearing stories. My mother used to tell stories of our, I guess would be my great grandmother, um, losing her husband and children during the influenza epidemic mm. of the early 1900s, which killed thousands so of people. people and targeted, ironically, middle-aged white men. That was the target. And, and it was brutal. Uh, I heard the stories and, you know, you hear them. It resonates just like you hear stories about, like you said, World War II or, you know, horrible things uh, in, in our lifetime, you know, Chernobyl, uh, Bosnia, Kosovo, things like that, the Iraq war. But until it affects you personally, just like a kid who you say, don't touch that stove, you're going to get burned. And then they finally burn themselves and go, oh, yeah. wow, that really hurts. So unfortunately, I think, you know, again, we've, <laughs> we've learned firsthand that, you know, life is, life is precious and uh, things like this always will happen. I believe we'll recover from it. You know, uh, as we, as we do, we will come back, we will be stronger. But this is unfortunately one of those lessons that that we're all, you know, forced to live through. And it certainly will affect how we do things from now on, I, I have to well, say. Well, if, if one mean, of your kids was looking at you and he just said, hey, dad, I'm, I'm really scared. I feel like, is this the end of the world? Like, what's, what's going on? What, what would you say to them? Well, I, I don't feel like the world is ending because life does go on. And we, we you know, we've, we've made adjustments. I mean, my, my kids now, we, we go out. They're used. They pick up their masks, you know, without being told. And, they, and they've, as, as kids are, they're very adaptive. But they lead by example. So if you show fear to them, then they'll be afraid. Well, hey, do you think that the human race is going to survive and have a bright future? Are you an optimistic person? I'm from New York. I'm a pessimist by nature. But yes, <laughs> I do. I do think you, Matt. I think the human race will survive and thrive. You know, uh, I just, you know, I was back in New York City just a couple weeks ago. Uh, 
And uh, I have to say, it was like the zombie apocalypse. It was not the New York of recent years. It was a little scary, and it, it, it definitely sobered me a little bit to what's going on in the rest of the world. We can be very insulated here in L.A., you know, driving around in your car and going back and forth to the mall and whatever. But I, 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 I have to say I do, I do have hope that we will come back. Me too. I, I'm very hopeful. I'm a very optimistic person. I'm, I'm, I always have been. I've always been a very positive kid, and I, I have a lot of faith in humanity, to be honest. Even when they piss me off, I still have a lot of faith in them. You know, <laughs> overall, I think, I think most human beings are good people. You know? Yeah. One of my favorite questions to ask guests is, if you were elected president of the United States tomorrow, what are the first three things you'd do? Take a shower, put on pants. <laughs> I haven't worn pants since March. All right. After you make... you're dressed, what are the three <laughs> first the first three policy changes you'd make? Uh, I don't know about policy changes. You know, I, I would have to say, for me personally, I would have to go back and actually read the Constitution. I don't know that I've ever read it as a as a document. I've never read it except maybe in school. I would have to really go and read it and have someone much smarter than me explain to me all the nuances of it before I did one thing as the president. So you've gotten dressed and you've read the Constitution. Uh, what's the third thing? Every every Friday should be official pizza day. Everybody should just have pizza all the time because it's the perfect food. Oh, my God. And what are we doing? Come on. Everybody just stop what you're doing and have a slice. The Pascal world would be Lone, so much 2024. better. I'm on That's your campaign it. trail, brother. That's it. If you could continue to live a healthy life, how long would you ideally like to live? Uh, I don't know. I want to go out like Sinatra. I want to go out, uh, you know, kicking and screaming with a martini in one hand, a cigarette in the other, you know, and uh, <laughs> and still looking tan. <laughs> so no set date. You're not like, nah. oh, I'm going to make it to 100. Nah. I okay. don't care about numbers. Are you afraid of dying? No. Again, I grew up in New York. You can't be afraid of death when you grow up in New York. You got to just deal with it. If it happens, it happens. Uh, no, I don't think about it. I don't worry about it. All right. I come from pretty good genetics. My father's 89 years old, still out playing golf. You know. That's awesome. Yeah. Living his life, doing his thing. All right. So how old are you now? 50. I'll be 54. All right. So you're almost 54. From your perspective, what do you think is the purpose or meaning of life besides pizza on Fridays? Oh. Uh, one thing. One thing. And if you can figure out what that one thing is. <laughs> <laughs> City Slickers. I love City it. Slickers. There you go. Curly. I think he had it right. The one thing. It's different for everybody. There is no one thing, you know. Uh, the meaning of life. Uh, I think you said it before. It's love. It's all about love. Loving yourself so that you can love others. Teaching others to love. You know, expressing it in different ways. Uh, but unconditionally. And without reservation. Uh, and if we all did that, we'd be a much happier planet. Agreed. Rick, what's your spirit animal? Is there such a thing? I, I don't know. It's up to the individual. Is a, is a vodka tonic a spirit animal? I don't know. It is now. Well, it is. <laughs> <laughs> if I could come back as anything, I, I would definitely come back as my dog. I got to tell you. He lived a good life. What's, uh, what was your dog? Yeah, I had a pharaoh hound uh, who lived like a kid. He lived like Sinatra, huh? He lived like Sinatra, if Sinatra was a dog, for sure. That's awesome. Well, hey, man, I really appreciate you checking back with us, and I certainly Absolutely. wish you and the and Denise and the kids the best of everything. Hopefully we'll see you. You owe me a pasta dinner, by the way, don't yeah, forget. Yeah, I so sure do. I as, sure as, do. as soon as COVID's over, we will be there. That sounds good to me. All right, brother, you take care and have a great day. All right, you do. If you'd like some more Moonbird in your life, and hey, who wouldn't? Head on over to memoriesofamoonbird.com or visit me on social media at Memories of a Moonbird.